Now imagine a world in which AI is going to make our work more productive, efficient and effective. This world is not a distant future but a reality of today and AI is the gateway to the new digital world, a utopia of technology and innovation. However, it is said what we get tomorrow depends upon what we do today. With this thought in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you all to the session on AI and the new digital world ahead. I now request Ms. Nirvati Rai, Country Head, Intel India, and Vice President, Data Center and Products Group, Intel Technology India Private Limited, to take the session forward and kindly deliver her welcome remarks. A very, very good morning to everyone and a warm welcome to this session of AI and the new world ahead. Now, this topic is very, very close to my heart. And I honestly thank Vicky, Vicky for providing this wonderful platform that enabled us to bring global leaders, experts together to share and explore with us, leverage India's strengths, opportunities in this new post pandemic world. The new AI world I see is full of distributed intelligence. It ushers an era where AI augments human capacity, capability, and intelligence. And what does it do? It helps us do more with less. We only have just scratched what the surface of what AI will enable us to do with search engines, recommendation engines, chatbots, and so on. What I believe in the future, AI-based technologies will ensure everyone has access to affordable and excellent quality healthcare. It will also make, for example, our roads safer. India today sees 17 deaths an hour due to road accidents. AI can help solve that. There is no doubt in my mind that artificial intelligence has unparalleled potential to transform the critical sectors very pertinent to our lives, like healthcare, education, agriculture, and smart mobility. According to a very recent report, what we heard was AI has the potential of bringing about $1 trillion to our economy in the next 10 to 15 years and help us accomplish the goal set by our Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji. I also want to share with you that we are making tremendous progress in that area. An analysis recently quoted that India is using AI-based technologies to the level that we had never seen before. We saw 45% increase in the usage and adoption of AI. And I must tell you, it is way higher than economies such as US, UK, and Japan. That said, you know, for us to make full use of the potential and capability of AI a reality, we need to focus on four key vectors. The first one, data. Access to data and compute infrastructure is an absolute requirement. And we all know India is a data rich country. Each one of us is a data factory. And we have platforms, national level platforms like UPI, Aadhaar, GSTN, and rapidly growing digital customer base. Today, we have 700 million smartphone users. Do you know how much data they are consuming? 300 petabytes of data per year. Peta has you know, 15 zeros ahead of it. We need to continue investing to build our compute capabilities and leverage our local, global, domestic players and build this database infrastructure, that's a requirement. Second, a recent Gartner study called out that if you look at all AI resources, US has 16%, China has 9%, and I'm very happy to tell you that India has 8% of the world AI experts and resources. Not only that, we have 6 million software developers and the rate at which our developers is growing is unparalleled. We are seeing 10x faster growth of our software developers, our data analytics, and our ML experts. 
as compared to any other nation, 10x more. Just this last two years, we saw 400,000 developer added to our base. Now, what do we use these developers for? To focus on AI-based human-centric solutions. Third, we are a very large startup nation. We have about 9,000 technology-related startups and 34 unicorns. Looking ahead, they will be using AI-based technologies and drive solutions, not just for India, but for the world. Lastly, none of this would be possible unless we have a solid support from the policies, from the government, from the regulations. And I'm really happy to see that this technology platform that we all put together has a wonderful combination of academicians, industry leaders, a government, as well as startups. So looking forward to contribute towards, you know, our AI mission and vision. Our government has already started putting together a national AI strategy and establish right global partnerships and frameworks. We have all the building blocks necessary. However, what we have to commit to do is we have to commit to work together. I'm extremely optimistic and confident that our collective wisdom will make the vision of our prime minister, the vision he has set for India and for the world a reality. Bring AI for greater good way above you and me, our companies, our countries. It's for humanity. Having said that, let me tell you the, the eminent leaders that we were able to bring together for this forum. And I'm happy when I thought of AI and next gen and the world tomorrow and value, the few leaders that came to my mind, and I'm really happy to tell you that every single one of them accepted our invite. So to start with, we have a fireside chat with um, our very own Dr. Sangeeta Reddy and Dr. Satya Nadella are uh, going to be talking about uh, you know, AI and tomorrow. Dr. Sangeeta Reddy uh, um, is the president of FICI and joint managing director of Apollo Hospitals Group. She's a global healthcare leader, entrepreneur, and a humanitarian. Sangeeta is extremely passionate and committed to transforming healthcare through the use of technology and, you know, already accelerating the transformation. I must also add, she's a great friend. And I'll tell you, despite being at the level that she is, despite the resources she has, the energy she has to accomplish more, I just cannot explain to you. Every day she is looking at what can we do more with technology. I also must tell about Satya Nadella. I really don't think I need to introduce him, but he's the chief executive officer of Microsoft for the last seven years. Prior to that, he has held several leadership roles in both enterprise and consumer businesses across the company. Most importantly, he led the transformation uh, that we see of cloud infrastructure and service business. Not only is he technologically savvy, but immense shrewd businessman. But to top it all, you know, my heart kind of felt warm. But when you think Satya Nadella, you think EQ. The man's EQ is unparalleled. So without further ado, I want to invite Dr. Sangeeta Reddy and Satya Nadella for the wonderful fireside chat that you will very soon see and witness. Hello, Satya. It's just outstanding to have you and to be in conversation with you. You are one of the world's most iconic leaders, and Fiki is delighted to have you at our annual convention. You know, there, there are a hundred questions that everybody wants to ask you, and you know, I did put it out on my Twitter uh, saying, I'm going to be in conversation with Satya, and what would you like to ask him? And there was just this tremendous response, but I, I picked two of those and a few of my own, so I'm going to go straight in. I think no conversation in 2020 uh, is complete without a question on the pandemic. So uh, just, just you know, jumping straight into that, how do you see the world changing? What do you believe is the role of tech? Just share your thoughts on the year 2020 
Absolutely. First of all, Sangeeta, it's such an honor to be with you uh, and the entire community. Um, and, you know, to your point, this has been a year unlike anything else, right? I mean, none of us, uh, I think we last saw each other even at Davos, and none of us would have expected that uh, come March, uh, the level of constraints the world has been operating under uh, is what we would see. Uh, but the thing that I am most uh, amazed by is the level of productivity. In spite of all of the constraints, Sangeeta, the fact that here we are, able to conduct the mission critical business, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in financial services, uh, that is just pretty amazing. It's amazing because of all the infrastructure that has been built for us to be able to transcend, I would say, some of the constraints. But this has been the time where digital tech uh, being that most malleable of resources is being adopted at scale, both for core resilience, right? There's not going to be a single boardroom where they're not going to talk about digital technology as something that is nice to have. It's going to be core, not just for their future transformation, but for their business continuity. So that's, I think, perhaps the biggest structural change that I see. We see it in healthcare. You, you know, you are the expert. I mean, even the work that you are doing, and uh, which you were kind enough to speak at our CEO forum about, you know, telemedicine. We've been talking about it for decades. Guess what? Every session now will be, you know, an outpatient visit will start with an AI triage tool. Will then go to a, a, a sort of a, a video call, and then ultimately you may show up at the hospital, and that is going to be structural change. Same thing is happening in retail. Uh, you know, I was even talking to a small business in the United States that was able to do a quick pivot to curbside pickup uh, by just building an app for that. Uh, and so that ability to use digital tools to be able to deal with a tail event. Uh, because we can't predict what the next tail event is, but whatever that is, uh, I think our built-in infrastructure and capability around digital tech uh, is going to create resilience and transformation. And that, I think, is the most exciting thing to see. Absolutely, and, and I completely agree with you. So, Satya, just going on, what we you know, are talking about now is enhanced adoption of some of the foundational things that were put in maybe over the last few years or the last decade, those who had it, those who were ready, were able to adapt and change quickly. But I read something that you said, and I thought that was, you know, so significant. You said that Buddha didn't, you know, set out to find religion. He actually wanted to find the cause of suffering. And then you went on to say, you know, as life is playing its up and down, one of the things to, to understand and deal with is impermanence. And you said that before 2020. So just in that scope of impermanence, in that scope of change, but with the foundation of digital, where do you see the world going? Three years, five years out, where do you see the world going? The business of sort of change forecasting. It's a very dangerous uh, business because it's always uh, hard to predict uh, the future. But I think one can sort of look at what are the broad paradigms that are in fact reshaping uh, the expectations and especially the exponential curve, Sangeeta? I've always felt uh, that I've been able to sort of be, a, you know, navigate change whenever at least I understood that whatever that change is, it's exponential. Because if most of us as human beings are capable of adopting and adapting uh, to linear change, but we have a lot of discomfort around exponential change. And the exponential change, I think, is tech. Uh, and there are three layers of it, right? Whether it is the core ubiquity of computation, right? Even in the context of India, uh, when I think about what is happening, the innovation in India around digital infrastructure in every field from financial services uh, to healthcare to uh, retail, it's tremendous to see. And that's because of the ubiquity of the computing fabric that's available to every Indian business and every Indian citizen. Uh, the layer of, uh, you know, AI and data capabilities that now are getting embedded in every consumer and business experience and application. That's tremendous. The experience, I mean, the ubiquity of mobile phones in India has completely changed the expectations of what it needs to be self-service. So I think the exponential adoption of these three layers is what, in my mind, you know, is going to change a lot of what, will happen. But to your point, though, 
is sort of very profound because we as human beings and as human societies can only deal with so much change. And so the question is, what is that social contract we have between the government, the private sector, and the citizens and the broad civic society that allows us to create that harmony, to navigate this change together. Because if any one of us is changing and the others are being left behind, that's going to create more turmoil. Uh, and to me, that's probably one of the things, I think currency in today's world is how do you bring everybody together to navigate what are these exponential curves? What an amazing thought. And it, it really, you know, reflects what so much of your action, your thought about inclusivity. Uh, I love the fact that you keep saying healthcare, and I hope it's not just because you're talking to me, but because you deeply believe in the transformation in healthcare. Uh, but, you know, what you spoke about led me to, to jump straight into one of the questions which came out, uh, you know, on my Twitter and from someone. And they said, what can uh, technology do to help public administration. Because, you know, we, we love, we love our country, of course, we love the world, but we see so many things which could be better if done differently. Uh, so how do you visualize technology, change and public administration? Yeah, I mean, having grown up as a, a son of an Indian civil servant, uh, you know, I, I think quite a bit, uh, Sangeeta, about uh, public sector and also the institutional strength uh, of uh, public sector institutions is so important. I mean, in fact, it's living in the United States, uh, living in, say, the county I live in, uh, it's been, I am more subject to the state of the art of the public health institution uh, that has jurisdiction over the, in the county that I live in. And so we all sometimes think that, you know, it's just any one sector, but we need all of these institutions to be super strong. So I absolutely think uh, one of the foundational jobs I think all of us have is how do we get uh, the public sector to the efficient frontier of even technology use? Uh, and this is where I think some of the work that's happening in India, whether it is the ID system or the banking APIs or the payment APIs, or it's pretty enlightened. Uh, in fact, uh, I was even on another panel earlier this uh, today, and someone else was referencing India as a case study uh, of some real profound change being driven, uh, you know, across both private and public sector. So, I think foundationally, I think job number one is to make sure that our public sector is being supported in their modernization. Uh, and then the public-private partnership is really helping adopt all of the changes more and bring about more ubiquity to that change. And I think that that's going to be very, very important. And I think that's one way for developing economies to be able to, one, recover from the pandemic, but more importantly, when we have talked about catch-up growth, I think it's absolutely possible in the next 10 years uh, Catch-up growth is possible when both the public institutions and the private sector both in tandem are able to move and, uh, and really move rapidly. So that, that's so true. And, and it is uh, completely right that there's some fantastic things happening in India right now. And we have a very enlightened leadership. So, you know, we are looking forward to a much better future just in terms of the way things work. Yep. Uh, moving on, uh, Satya, I think this is this was important to me uh, to really ask you because you know there are tremendous things that you have done. Uh, you know whether you the way you pivoted Microsoft, the the thought process of of moving so intensely to cloud, your very famous uh, uh, ability to to work with frenemies. And, you know, you, you pulled out the Apple phone from your pocket in, in one conference. So it's not about what you did, but what was the thought process? And, you know, we've all read, hit refresh. We've, we've understand what you've done. But what was the thought process which helped you think through what to do? It's a fascinating question because, in fact, even as we sort of, you know, sit here today, the thing that, I've been reflecting a lot on is what are the necessary conditions uh, to be able to deal with complexity, right? I mean, I've been thinking a little bit like, you know, hopefully 2021, 
uh, spring, uh, summer, we have, the pandemic is behind us. How do we approach it? And uh, what exactly are the actions we need to take? And to your question, Sangeeta, I always go back and in any time uh, I try to answer any question, I go back to two things. What's that sense of purpose uh, that drives and gives meaning to our organization? And what's that culture that we have inside the organization that helps us sustain and keep that center and center of focus. Uh, and so to me, you know, for example, when I when people talk, I've grown up in Microsoft now close to 30 years, uh, but I go back all the way to 1975 and the creation of the company when Bill and Paul said, hey, let's build a uh, basic interpreter for the Altair. The reality is in 2020, uh, that opportunity exists, you know, with a much bigger, you know, it's a much bigger opportunity because we want to create technology so that every organization out there in India and elsewhere can create their own technology, right? Because it's not about celebrating our tech, it's about tools for other people to be able to create more tech. And that, you know, gives us, I think, a real direction to what we are trying to get done. But the other part, Sangeeta, is also culture. I distinctly remember the first time Microsoft became the largest company in the world was the late 90s. Uh, and quite frankly, from ancient times to modern Silicon Valley, the only thing that has sort of gotten in the way of sustained success is hubris. Uh, we all thought that, you know, in the late 90s that we were brilliant, except, you know, you're only as brilliant as your ability to learn today so that you can do something more useful tomorrow. Uh, and so having that learning posture, and this is where borrowing that growth mindset meme from Carol Dweck's work in child psychology has been so helpful to us because every day you have to sort of confront the fact that you are imperfect, but you can learn. And that helps us stay grounded and centered on your mission. So this, you know, although it's overused, overtalked, I feel like those are the only two truths that one has. Uh, the only two pillars one can fall back to when things get, in fact, more confusing, your sense of purpose and mission and your culture. And once you have that, then you have to get a lot of things right, but your chances of getting all those other things right, like strategies and tech picking and people picking, become so much more easier with these two pillars. So that's fantastic. It's, it's culture, it's purpose. So this from the band was created, I mean, you have been called one of the largest wealth creators of the decade. So culture and purpose are at the core and the foundation. Thank you for that, Satya. Uh, I, I think as you know, we move on just, just a little bit longer, but uh, you know, the whole world is shaped by multiple things and it is, it is culture, it is people, it's the vibrancy and the buoyancy of a population, uh, it's startups, it's, you know, it's a hundred things. But what do you think as leaders, you know, what should leaders kind of do? Because they don't just shape their own company. They shape the environment. They shape, you know, the lives of so many employees. So, so what are your leadership mantras? You have a whole lot of leaders out there listening to you right now at the FIKI convention. And, and so what would you kind of say to, to leaders of, of India and leaders of the world? I mean... One thing that Sangeeta, at least I like to sort of hold a mirror to myself, quite frankly, is on three attributes, which I think are the attributes of every leader. Uh, and so in some sense, each day I ask myself whether, uh, how did I do on these three? And the three that I really reflect on is, leaders have this very innate capability of coming into ambiguous, uncertain situations and creating clarity, right? You don't ever have leaders who come into an uncertain situation and create confusion. They just bring about clarity when none exists. Second, leaders are great at creating energy, right? I mean, you know, when somebody, you go walk into a room and you're amongst a leader or you're with a leader, um, they create energy for everybody. It's not just, oh, my team is good and my company is good, but they just bring about, you know, energy for all the constituents. And so that, I think, is the second uh, capability of leaders. And then the last one is, we can't wait for the perfect pitch, right? I mean, I can't say, hey, look, I can't, you know, let, I'll perform after the pandemic is done. I mean, no, you and I and everyone in the room has to keep working in spite of what the world throws at us. Uh, and that ability to solve sometimes the over-constrained problem is what leadership is all about and driving success. So to me, creating clarity, generating energy and driving success 
uh, is what I think leaders innately are capable of. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect all the time. Uh, but as they say in cricket, uh, you know, you know, your class is permanent even if your form is temporary, and you have to keep practicing that. So, so perfect. You led me into my final question. Uh, the pitch is so important. But if you were given an option between a cricket game, the World Cup, and the Super Bowl. Which one would you choose, Satya? Well, I mean, you know, I love my Seahawks and uh, uh, it might be a tough call, but I'll still probably go for a Cricket World Cup if India is playing for sure in the finals. Okay, that's so cool. Uh, India loves you, Satya, as does the world. You are a global icon and thank you so much for being with Vicky, for being with us at the convention and for the great inspirational leader that you are. Thank you. Uh, which we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. Thank you very much. What a wonderful conversation we just heard from uh, Satya and Sangeeta. And true to my expectation, the man with really high EQ, he left me with few words, sense of purpose, grounded, centered. On top of that, he said, you know, our growth in the past was linear. What is driving growth now is exponential because of technology. The next guy is a perfect continuation to uh, the expectation Satya said. This man is not just by name Raja Koduri. And by the way, Raja means king. He indeed is the king of technology when it comes to graphics, when it comes to software, and when it comes to the usage of uh, software and graphics technology for applications. I wanted to introduce my esteemed colleague and a friend, Raja Kuduri. He's a senior vice president, chief architect and general manager of graphics and software group in Intel. He leads the expansion of uh, integrated graphics for the PC market with discrete graphic solutions for a broad range of computing segments and driving AI with graphics AI with compute, AI with connectivity, basically computing wherever computers require. I would like to welcome Raja Koduri to give his keynote and entertain you with the technology that he's building. Thank you, Nivruti, for the warm introduction. I would like to thank Fiki for extending me this invitation. And I'm very much honored to be presenting in this forum. In 2011, Mark Andreessen famously said, software is eating the world. With that statement, he was implying the impact software is having in our daily lives. Decades earlier, another man and his company created a pipeline that resulted in us being able to feed this huge appetite for software that is now eating the world. FC Kohli and TCS trained millions of engineers coming out of universities on this new discipline that wasn't yet taught in universities called software engineering. TCS under Mr. Kohli pioneered methodologies to take large scale software problems, break them down to smaller chunks and execute them successfully with a large globally distributed workforce. Mr. Kohli and TCS were an inspiration for many software entrepreneurs that eventually built an impressive $200 billion IT industry in India. His inspiration will be with us as we look forward to the next era in computing. Today, I'd like to talk to you about a few things that I'm passionate about. Democratization of compute, the era of distributed intelligence, and the role India can play in this era. Having been brought up in India, I share a strong emotional bond and rooting for India's continued success in technology. I'm an architect and engineer at heart, which means I like to step back and look at the big picture. So please permit me to do that today. The clock is ticking. A new frontier of computing is coming one that will change the paradigms of computing and will need bold investments by all. India, too, needs a strategic view of how the nation can not only thrive in the future, but lead on a global stage. 
To do this, you must build that vision and make bold investments now. So why is everyone so excited about AI and keep talking about how it is the next thing and it will change the world, etc., etc.? I'll try and explain in my simple words how I think about AI. For many, many years, we as people observed things all around us and experimented with them. We call these observations data. We analyzed this data and generated insights, insights that led to new technologies that enriched our lives one way or another. These new technologies also helped us generate more data more efficiently that we analyzed again and therefore generated more insights that benefited us even more. This relentless iterative loop has led to many amazing advances for humanity, from inventing the wheel to space travel. As many have noted, this iterative technology loop accelerated tremendously in the last 50 years since the invention of computers and this little phenomenon called Moore's Law. AI technology, in my simple words, is technology that is dramatically accelerating this iterative loop. We are now seeing this loop coming down from what used to take many years to days. And eventually, we will see this loop come down to milliseconds. So what is the reason behind this dramatic acceleration? And why do we expect to see more changes in this coming decade than the last four put together? The key words are computational democratization. When we made a lot of computation available to a lot of people, major disruptions happened. First, the PC era. We started with kiloscale computing in 80s and 90s for everyone. And today, you have terascale computing even in a small, thin and light laptop. This era helped us digitize all information that we had access to and also network all the computers we could. Eventually, we got one billion people connected to the internet. This era changed the way we work, learn, and entertain ourselves. Then came the mobile era and cloud era, where we had over 10 billion connected devices. The computational access in this era scaled from megascale to petascale. This era changed the way we live. Moore's Law played a key role in enabling these disruptions, making computing exponentially faster, cheaper, and smaller, relentlessly every 18 to 24 months. Let's take a look at these errors in the context of India now. Digitization of India started a little late, but India now leads with 700 million smartphone users. India today has the highest per user 4G data consumption in the world, and that too at the lowest cost per bit. India definitely has taken leadership position in democratizing connectivity. When we look at cloud infrastructure compute, India still has a way to go before it catches up with leading countries. For example, for every server installed in India in 2020, the United States will deploy 24 and China 17. India's current cloud computing capacity is simply not enough to meet the needs of 1 billion people. But I think there is a way for India to lead as we enter this next era. So what's the next era? We call it the distributed intelligence era, where we will see over 100 billion distributed, connected, and intelligent devices that will enrich our lives in more ways than we can imagine. I believe India can leapfrog to this era. This era is an exciting challenge for technology and I'm optimistic that we can overcome this challenge. Why is it challenging? It is because intelligence is not cheap. It is very expensive. Let's take a look at the computational complexity of some of the popular AI neural networks of today. I know these are a lot of numbers, but I would like to draw attention to two things. First, computational demands of some of the newer AI networks are doubling every three to four months. This is faster than the exponential rate of Moore's law, which helped us in the last two eras. The second thing is, it takes a whole day to train one of these networks with a petaflop computer. Now, 
a petaflop is 10 to the power of 15. This seems like a large number, but very soon in 2021, you'll see this level of compute fit in the palm of your hand. This is our XEHP chip architecture that we are sampling to customers today. In fact, large portions of this chip were designed and developed at our design center in Bangalore. The next challenge is to learn at an even faster rate, from one day down to a few seconds. That's a thousand X increase we need over petascale. That's exascale. Exascale is big, but it is within reach in 2021. You can take 1,000 of these petascale chips and build an exascale system from them. You'll see few of these exascale systems deployed in 2021 across the world. But the ultimate goal is to learn in real time, like in milliseconds. That's another 1,000x increase over exascale. That's zettascale. That may seem like an insane amount of compute. But this is where the distributed connectivity with low latency, high-speed optical networks comes into play. A thousand exascale computers distributed and connected with low latency, high-speed optical networks. That gets you zettascale. We need this 1,000x increase in compute, not only in the big mega data centers, but also at the sensors, edge, and throughout the network. Recently, we made a call for the whole industry to work together across what we call six pillars to deliver this 1,000x increase of AI compute by 2025. The reason why we need compute advances from sensors to the data centers is because it is not practical, safe, or efficient to move all the data from sensors to the cloud all the time. We are generating data at a faster rate than our ability to analyze and transmit it in real time across the whole network. This data generation is stressing the whole network to need more capacity and bandwidth at every level of memory and network hierarchy. How about we reduce the need to move so much data? We won't need to move a ton of data if we move the compute near the data. This leads us to our edgy anecdote. What happens at the edge stays at the edge. Taking inspiration from the famous quote, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You just take the fun memories back, not the details. Same with data. Much of the data turning into insights should happen at the edge. This is a massive compression opportunity and also helps protect your data. You keep your data close to you and share the insights you choose to share to help enrich the lives of others. A thousand X increase in compute performance seems like a daunting number, particularly given the recent commentary around the slowdown of Moore's law. To get to 1,000x by 2025, our entire industry will need to work together across all the key technology pillars. Let me walk you through how. First pillar is process technology and packaging. We expect the combination of transistor and wire density scaling along with new packaging technologies to deliver a 4x improvement for AI compute by 2025. Second pillar is memory. Many innovations are in the pipeline as AI is very memory intensive. Higher density memories with much higher bandwidth and efficiency, leveraging advanced packaging will deliver 4X or more AI performance. Third pillar is compute architecture itself. We see a major transformation for the whole industry moving from CPU to XPU architectures. Compelling optimizations with 4x or more performance for AI workloads are realized when we productively combine CPU, GPU, and FPGA-style computations into XPU architectures. Fourth pillar is interconnects. These are the networking technologies that can connect chips from the ranges of few microns to several hundred miles. 4x improvements enabled by advancement in packaging, silicon photonics, high-speed SERDIs, 
and network software architecture are well in sight by 2025. Again, 4x improvement over five years is less than the traditional Moore's law gain. These vectors deliver a cumulative 256 times improvement from the hardware pillars. We also expect a minimum of 4x improvement in performance from software efficiency. If you were to ask most experts, they will tell you that there is in fact a lot more room for improvement in software efficiency, what some have called room at the top of the computing stack, and they demonstrate over 1000x improvement in software alone for certain AI algorithms. Without even needing to rely on the four hardware pillars I got you all excited about. And this is where India, home to over 6 million software developers, has an inherent advantage to enter the distributed intelligence era sooner than later. The gains across these five pillars are multiplicative for many AI workloads. So we can realize four to the power of five equals 1024x improvement. This seemed like a huge unachievable number at first, but when we broke it down across these five vectors, it seems much more solvable. I want to take all of what you heard today and map it back to an India that I want us all to dream about. A zeta scale distributed connected compute available with equal access to everyone across the whole country. I would like to dream that this is the India of 2025, a zeta scale India. Now let us look at zeta scale again. It's a large number with 21 zeros next to the one. These large numbers may seem quite daunting for us in the modern world, but mathematicians in ancient India comprehended larger numbers than this a long time ago. In fact, Sanskrit is the only language where I could find individual names for each of the powers of 10 up to infinity and beyond. In preparing for this talk, I was delighted to find what zeta scale is in Sanskrit and was also inspired to target the next scale of numbers. I'm sure there is a reason these large numbers have names. We just need to get there to find out why. I want to sign off my talk with this self-reliant computational vision for India. Koti Pakoti Gananaka Atmanirbhar Bharat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raja, for the wonderful description of the needs of India 50 plus exascale data center requirement, 1000x a performance requirement. The next speaker we have is Dr. Anish Shah. What can I say? You know, he is the MD and impending CEO for the Mahindra Group, a group that deals with cars to real estate and everything in between from mobility to energy to finance to infrastructure and technology i was talking to anish and he's super excited about bringing more and more technology and ai into what mahindra group does prior to joining mahindra anish was president and ceo of ge capital from 2009 to 14. the innovations he led were immense. One of them that I would like to call out is he led the transformation of business, including a complete turnaround of its SBI card joint venture. Loving to see how Anish will take Mahindra to the new heights, much more than 18% growth. Very welcome, Anish. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Nibruti, for the very kind introduction. And uh, good morning and good evening to everyone joining us around the world. It's truly a pleasure to participate in Fiki's annual event on a panel that is addressing questions that will be a key factor in enabling India to meet its growth ambitions. Uh, Nivruti, as you said, we are across 20 industries and I'd like to share a perspective from industry. Uh, for us, beyond the span, what we're more proud of is being a trusted partner for farmers and for aspirational urban consumers and their families. We see AI 
across many of our industries. And we see this as a step change. AI offers tremendous potential and challenges. But the bigger question for us as leaders is how do we leverage its full potential? And let's take a quick perspective or a quick look at that. Let's start with potential. AI is widely used for recommendation engines, voice assistants, targeted ads, or even political campaigns. But the real frontier for AI is human-centric opportunities to help solve humanity's biggest needs, health, agriculture, education, smart mobility, to enrich lives, to protect them. A prime minister has shared a vision to make India a 5 trillion economy by 2025 while ensuring sustainable and inclusive development. This requires doubling farm income, a quantum jump in manufacturing productivity, a much stronger base of infrastructure in logistics, financial inclusion across all strata of society and both urban and rural divides, real-time marketplaces, uh, services like healthcare, and a lot more. How can AI be used to meet these objectives? Let's take a few examples. We are working today with farmers to help them spot disease and pest problems early, to help them identify disease hotspot locations so they can target spraying of pesticides and thereby reduce consumption, which also makes for healthier crops. We can help identify the exact amount of fertilizer required at every square meter of land on their plot, predict harvest readiness, and a number of other actions around productivity. In manufacturing, we're leveraging AI to simulate advanced testing environments and predict results for hot and load tests for our engines. Our auto paint shops leverage AI to reduce rework and save significant cost. From precision farming and manufacturing to AI-based credit underwriting, road network optimization, and a variety of other solutions, these are the various things that make me optimistic that AI can really drive a significant impact, not just at the micro level, but across a broad range of industries. What then are the challenges? The biggest one that we see in implementing some of these solutions is a resistance to change. Sometimes it's a fear of losing jobs. Uh, sometimes it's the inability to really comprehend what the bigger picture is. And that creates a problem. Uh, and that's not only at the company level, but that often is as we collaborate with other partners, it creates bigger questions of why are we doing this? The other challenge is talent. Technology is moving quickly. And are we keeping pace with skill building? The third challenge is privacy. This is all based on data. Whose data are we using? How are we using it? Uh, is it individual still? Is it done in an aggregation? Uh, what are the laws around privacy? And that leads to the fourth one, which is ethical dilemmas. Uh, when should AI be used? When should it not be used? Uh, these are some of the questions that are coming up and uh, answers to them are not forthcoming as yet, but we can address these with a concerted effort. That is our role as leaders. And therefore, let me outline a call to action. The first one I would say there is public-private partnerships. I'll share an example on protecting lives. Nivruti talked about road accidents. She mentioned 17 deaths an hour. That, that's a lot. That's an average of one death every three minutes. The UN study had estimated a loss of 3 to 5% of GDP annually. Uh, we are working currently with the Maharashtra government to try and make the Mumbai-Pune highway a zero fatality road by leveraging AI and other technologies to save lives. Intel is a key partner in helping this as well. Cross-industry partnerships is the second call. Uh, we are working today with Intel, with Microsoft, and various tech firms. But if we were to look at transformational solutions, 
they often exist in the white spaces between industries. Satya Nadella talked this morning about the importance of bringing everyone together. And that's an imperative if we are to make transformational solutions in this space. The third is skill building at local levels. The good part is we don't need brick and mortar everywhere anymore. But broad-based degrees are not effective either. Can we develop targeted education solutions to build skills for specific things that are required, a new version of vocational training that makes it easier to get jobs and to solve problems that are localized? An agile regulatory environment. Technology is evolving quickly, and we will need a regulatory framework that can keep pace with it. Recent examples are use of drones, privacy laws, but there will be many more, and we need to be ready to keep pace with technology there. And finally, AI cannot work in concentrated pockets. We need a platform. We need to be able to leverage AI in its full potential. It must be available to all companies and communities. This platform can bring together publicly shareable data, information, tools, literature, solutions, best practices. It can have a scope for sharing and driving standards, policy guidelines, entrepreneurship, and developing a creative economy. It will allow companies and communities to collaborate and build solutions that will benefit the society and enable India to meet its growth ambitions. And the platform has to be built in a contributory and participatory manner with all stakeholders, with the government, with the academy and research institutions, industry and corporate bodies, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. Uh, FITI, as a premier industry association, could help significantly in building this platform. So in conclusion, uh, from an industry perspective, we feel that AI is really one of the strongest tools we have today to make a quantum leap. And we need to work through the challenges. We need to collaborate. And that will really help us position India well, not just for the next five years, but going beyond for the next decade and a couple of decades as well. Thank you, and Nivruti, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anish. Uh, lovely uh, presentation, lovely ideas, thoughts. What we heard from Satya was let's build tools and technologies for people to build on. What we heard from Raja is the need for 1000x more compute. What I heard from Anish is we need to build a platform such that we can create a way where we can share data, we can leverage data, and we can create value out of data. There's also a need for standardization, policies, etc. Who else to better influence than our solid, strong academicians? I would like to introduce Professor Karim Lakhani, who is the Charles Edward Wilson Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. He's also the founder and co-director of the Lab for Innovation Science at Harvard and the principal investigator of the NASA Tournament Library at the Harvard Institute. He recently authored the best-selling book that I must tell that each one of us should read. It's called Competing in the Age of AI, which is not tomorrow, but today. Very welcome, Professor Karim. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for your warm uh, welcome, as well as uh, 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 my thanks to the FICI leadership for the invitation to give uh, this talk today. Um, so I'd like to first begin by thinking about the fact that all of us today are using AI in our daily lives. We've all entered the age of AI, whether that be if you make a, a purchase or payment through Paytm, you buy something through Flipkart, or when you message somebody through WhatsApp, or if you're using Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Tencent, Baidu, uh, you know, and Financial, all of these companies are providing billions of users with services that are AI powered. What we see in our research is that AI is changing the business architecture of companies. A company's business model, how it creates value and how it captures value, essential part of your strategy, 
and its operating model, how it achieves scale, how it serves lots of customers, how it achieves scope, how it offers customers many different things, and how it learns and, and improves. And our research is showing that AI is changing the foundation of how we create companies and how companies create. As Satya was saying, there's uh, exponential growth in technology. But in fact, these companies actually also have exponential growth in their value creation. And these companies that are AI first are colliding with incumbent companies that have fixed capacity or incremental capacity for value creation or growth. So imagine uh, an exponential curve colliding with a curve that is basically flat. Right? This collision we're seeing across the board in all types of industries. It started in the software industry, but now is showing up in industry after industry that we all see around us. And India, in many ways, is ground zero for many of these collisions uh, happening in, inside of uh, uh, their the economy. But if you sort of think about this, this collision between an exponentially grow, growing process and a fixed process is also the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis is exactly that. COVID as a disease creates patients at an exponential rate. But the way it works is that it's slow at the beginning. It's two patients. And then the next week it's four. And then the next week it's eight, right? Exponential processes take time to grow, but as they get growing and they get steam, they can overwhelm existing systems. So what's happened is that the whole world has woken up to both the power of exponential systems and thinking about our resiliency as a healthcare system or as, as, an, as countries to be able to respond to them. This same dynamic that the COVID crisis has caused worldwide is exactly what's also happening in business. Right? AI first companies have exponential processes underneath them and they're colliding with companies that have fixed capacity or very linear growth. And so this is creating a world of winners and losers. And it's imperative for leaders today to understand the processes that are being unleashed and adapt their companies to be able to succeed in this world of collision that we see going ahead. So what, is a, what does AI do in this world of business and how do you apply it? First of all, it's beyond science fiction. Our research shows that all companies are gonna have to have an AI factory at their core an AI factory, which basically automates decision-making and actions inside of your core. The AI factory will do three things. And these three things are important to consider. One is predictions, the second is pattern recognition, and the third is process automation. If you think about your company and all the predictions that people make, who should you hire? Who should you fire? Who should you promote? What should you set for pricing? What should you set for inventory? What should you do for, for customer churn? Those are all predictions being made and the AI factory can help you make them better. Same thing with pattern recognition. Imagine all the people that are doing pattern recognition in your company, right? Trying to find patterns in customer demand, customer behavior, employee behavior. Those are again things that the AI can help supercharge. And process automation, all the things you need to do to deliver something and how you might be able to automate those things. So the AI factory is gonna enable this to happen. And this AI factory will transform your company. But this transformation is actually going to be an organizational transformation as well. What we see over and over again is that the technology architecture that you build and the AI technology, as we sort of saw, demands a different architecture, will then, in, will then force you to change the organizational architecture as well. And this will require you, first of all, as a leader, to kill the silos that exist and enable data and software and people to flow across your entire enterprise. Customers don't want a siloed experience with you. They want a universal experience with you. And the AI factor is gonna enable that, but you as leaders have to be able to enable this and change your organization to make this happen. So there are four things you need to do as a leader to make this happen. First thing is you should start today. This technology is available today. We don't have to wait for Star Wars or Star Trek, right? This technology is today available off the shelf for you to use. And you need to think about where can you automate predictions, pattern recognitions and process automation for customer value. Start with the customer value proposition and think about where predictions, pattern recognition and process automation will improve customer uh, value. 
The second thing is you've got to fix your data story. Most of us are living in the craft age of data where people are working on Excel sheets, sending things over and over again to each other, right? And, and working through that. So that has to be done. And then you have to do pilots, but pilots have to be implemented and to be scaled. And then you, of course, have to transform your organization. If you don't transform your organization, you will be become like Nokia or Kodak, inventors of the technology, but, but, die, but dying because they did not transform their organization. So in conclusion, we're not gonna be living in a world of less data, uh, less connectivity and less algorithms. We are really at the beginning stages of this age of AI. There's tremendous potential in India to take the lead in this. And for the sake of your citizens, but also for the world, Indian businesses have a mandate to lead in this, in this space. And I wish you best of luck in making this happen. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kareem. I would now like to uh, invite upon Dr. Eric Schmidt, who is a 10-year veteran CEO, uh, has been for Google, uh, is an ex-chairman of Alphabet, and now the chairman of US National Security Commission on AI. His decade at Google made the company synonymous with search and the search advertising revenue model. Like we have heard from so many of our speakers, I would love to hear what Eric has to say with India, AI opportunities, technology and platforms. So over to Eric. Well, thank you, Navruti. And I really want to thank the, I'll just say it, the, the FICI uh, group, as well as the Carnegie Endowment for organizing this event and bringing us here today. It's really great to be alongside Satya, Raja, Kareem, and I obviously look forward to the Prime Minister's remarks right after. Um, I'm here in the capacity of the chair of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. This commission was created by the United States Congress to consider the methods and means necessary to advance the development of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and associated technologies to comprehensively address the national security and defense needs of the United States. I'm speaking, of course, in my position as the NSCAI chair today. What I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about the centrality of AI in our shared future and the importance of the United States pursuing AI developments through a lens of partnerships. And in particular, a partnership involving the United States and India, who I respect, admire, and really, really believe India will be part of the the story for all of us and particularly for the United States. So AI is a game changer. It's the most powerful tool in generations for expanding knowledge, increasing prosperity, enriching the human experience and expanding freedom. All science and, and engineering efforts will leverage AI. It'll be the foundation of the innovation economy and a source of enormous power for those who harness it, companies and nations. I feel an urgency to get AI right. I, I must say that my, my sense of urgency is amplified because of broader economic and strategic developments. You cannot ignore these trends in the international landscape. The United States competitors see power in AI in similar terms, and they're using it for different reasons or different means. Uh, China is rapidly becoming an AI peer in many areas and has concerted plans to invest, research and lead in AI. It's also no surprise that Russia is developing AI for military uses along with China, who has used AI as part of disinformation campaigns, which of course you could imagine what that does to us. So what's the nature of the problem? We're now in an AI charged technology competition fusing economic competitiveness, great power rivalry, a contest between authoritarianism and democracy. In other words, we're right in the middle now. And I wanted to sort of suggest four points. The first, which I think is obvious to our Indian friends, is that America and the United States alone will not work. Strong AI partnerships will be important to all aspects of the competition. The United States with its current and political partners, potential partners, must use the moment to renew their commitment to in protecting individual rights, restoring commercial competition built on fair rules, 
and strengthening defense alliances that have kept the peace in Europe and in the Pacific for 75 years. I don't want to lose that. Second, look, I think partnerships are not easy. AI presents genuine conundrums from US partners. Many are conflicted about America's tech dominance, looking to avoid getting trampled in a superpower competition, and they want to forge their own AI futures anyway. Notably, privacy concerns, fear of economic dependence uh, encourage European leaders to assert their technological sovereignty. In the Indo-Pacific, China's looming presence presents obstacles to deepening ties among democracies. Many states are leery about publicly choosing sides. This is a problem. Third, a, sh a shared sense of about China is building. The issues that divide us must not overwhelm the principles that unite us. Many states now see the strategic threat of building their digital future on Chinese infrastructure. They recognize the nature and magnitude of the risk posed by the Chinese companies harvesting data in service of the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. And like us, they abhor China's use of AI to supercharge surveillance, oppress minority groups, and impose ideological conformity. Fourth, partnership must be about a positive AI agenda. The AI futures that our partners yearn are not so different from what Americans seek. The development of AI can be a shared, shared endeavor, if you will, for a shared benefit. Research collaboration, pools of data to define or refine algorithms, principles for employing AI tools ethically and responsibly all benefit from our collective thought and action. And this is especially true for democracies who need to be more united than we are. Uh, I visited India last year with Dr. Kissinger and I continue to be amazed by the potential of your people and technology. India is a great partner today It'll be critical and a stronger partner tomorrow. India is a natural centerpiece of a coalition of democracies and a stronger bilateral partner. It possesses a thriving innovation economy, tremendous tech talent, shared democratic values, and a common interest in building a bulwark against authoritarianism in the Indo-Pacific region. Again, we have alignment here. The United States and India have a strong science and technology relationship. In the past two decades, the countries have been working closely on cyber, on information and tech communications technology, and in other areas. And in each of these areas, the dialogue has expanded in terms of quantity and quality. The, the US and India have also been partners in leading international forums around the development of, of this in international normative and technical standards for AI and associated technologies, which is crucial for our development of all of this. Beyond the S&T context, there are growing connections between the two nations, India and the United States, around our shared security concerns. There's something called the quadrilateral security dialogue among the United States, India, Japan, and Australia, which seems to be gaining strength. In October of this year, the nation's leaders met at the U.S.-India 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue, where all the parties welcomed the elevation of this comprehensive global strategic partnership, which is vital in my view, and I think in the United States view, to security and stability in the region and in the world. But we think that there is room to grow, and we believe that it's imperative that these nations work together to address these geopolitical challenges and rapid advances advancements, if you will, in AI and emerging tech. So as part of this, the commissioners and I in our AI, uh, AI commission have recently proposed a formal U.S.-India strategic tech alliance, literally a formal activity of the U.S. government, to develop a regional tech strategy and collaborate on joint research and development projects, talent exchanges, aligning our regulatory regimes, and using AI to address common societal concerns. Uh, the Commission sees the Tech Alliance as a critical step in the strategic focus or refocus of US policy in the Indo-Pacific region around emerging technology with India as its focal point. The Tech Alliance would build on the already strong relationship with, that we already have between the two largest democracies and focus on developing and implementing a strategy for, imp for emerging technology in this region. 
We recommend that this tech alliance involve periodic high-level meetings to develop an overarching strategy on issues involving emerging technology in the region. It would be supplemented with regular working groups to develop concrete operational venues for cooperation in the way that would be obvious. But I would suggest advanced joint research and development projects around AI, talent exchanges and talent flows, a range of issues on innovation, including emergency technology investment, uh, emerging technology investment, excuse me, aligning export controls, investment screening, and intellectual property rights, and the development of AI for societal application, and of course, using AI to counter disinformation. That list is a pretty good list for us to start with. We've also asked the United States Department of State to partner with India's Ministry of External Affairs to hold an inaugural high-level meeting and to use that meeting to agree on a contact, uh, on a concrete agenda, if you will, for collaboration. We also recommend that the U.S. government pursue formal AI cooperation agreements in the overall region, the Indo-Pacific region. This includes deepening the cooperation that the U.S., Australia, India, and Japan have through this quad that I mentioned earlier. This recommendation builds on the growing support for the quadrilateral security dialogue and the other nations in the Pacific region to focus on AI cooperation for both defense and security purposes. There are so many areas in which the two countries can deepen their collaboration. We think it would be particularly fruitful to examine joint R&D in advanced AI applications, talent ex exchanges, aligning investment screening and export control regulations, coordinating on patent protections, and exploring ways to create and use AI tools to counter disinformation and help address social needs. Um, I spent a fair amount of time in Bangalore, as you know, because of Google and before that because of Novell. And I know that there's tremendous talent and tremendous teams working between India and the United States already. I'd like to make those recommendations and collaborations stronger and more formal. Let me conclude that my optimism in this alliance is anchored in my faith of how America approaches the world. A U.S. call for partnership is not a demand for subservience. American interests are best served by leading voluntary co coalitions, literally what is best for India, what is best for America. I think that they're in alignment. It's a natural peer relationship. So these opportunities for partnerships, scientific, educational, commercial, and military are boundless. The opportunity drive, let's say it differently, the opportunity that is driven by AI is anchored in the American creed. As John F. Kennedy said, diversity and independence, far from being opposed to the American conception of world order, represent the very essence of our view of the future of the world. I really look forward to the rest of the discussion today. Thank you all and enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, for your uh, wonderful uh, uh, direction and aligned vision. Uh, and thanks to all the eminent speakers who gave a glimpse into the new digital world that lies ahead of us through technologies like AI, building tools, building the right culture, building the right people, and building the right policies. Thank you very, very much to all our speakers for making it so productive for all of us.